response video to Inventive Harvest. Uh, anyway, so I'll do this in pieces. I will try to take notes. I just can't watch it twice. It's just I can just see too stupid coming. Um, so the first clip, I might as well just play it. Um, so yeah, I asked him to address a couple of issues. And he's not going to address it in a kind of serious manner. No, just some more glibby crap. As such, I am addicted to the only thing in the universe that has value. Now, that's a simple syllogism, right? I certainly wouldn't. Right. Um, so you say it's the only thing that has value, life. No, it makes value. That was my argument, right? So that's called a disagreement. Or, you know, we don't have a common premise. So in a sense, it's one of those points where you just say, well, until we fix that, everything else is just sort of bullshit, right? You think life intrinsically has value. I think it intrinsically has absolutely no value as demonstrated by no explainable crisis that would take place when life doesn't occur on planet Earth. Just like there's no apparent crisis because there's no life on Mars. The universe isn't in crisis somehow. We can't recognize the crisis because we're obviously not terribly desperate to just, you know, send microbes to Mars. So, um, clearly, I don't think you can make this argument that it's the only thing of value in the universe, and yet you can't demonstrate the value to exist anywhere but in your perception. Where if there's a little rabbit in space and it feels, I can demonstrate the value of its feelings. Not the value of its life, the value of its welfare. So again, you just ignored the subject of addiction. The subject is, should you prevent the addiction, or should you give them heroin? I think the obvious answer is, it's better just to prevent the addiction than go through the kind of insane process of feeding the addiction. That's what I'd like you to address. But no chance, right? I'll be back. Okay, so now he's syllogizing, <laughs> syllogizing uh, this environmental argument. And so he's, he's now converting the environment into, you know, a cold emptiness, a vacuum, to the most energetic area of the universe, let's say, the highest uh, entropy, whatever. And then he talks about how life is supported in this little range. All right, well, one of the assumptions you're making here is that life, or even intelligence, could only ferment or, or con uh, condense out of this crap in this range. Well, that's true for maybe DNA, at least our DNA. But clearly, life, theoretically, could form in any one of these environments. Probably not the coldest environment, just because there wouldn't be enough density of energy, quanta, um, to, to create any kind of complexity. Um, but clearly there theoretically could be places in here where a great deal of complexity could be sustained or created that fed or um, was protected, shielded itself, you know, through its own creation of synthetic filters, much like our skin is a filter and um, yeah not a terribly important point also not recognized in this is that as far as we know the universe doesn't do this supporting life thing in a range because the universe theoretically doesn't have any other life in it we, we have no knowledge or evidence of life ever forming somewhere else of it not even forming on this planet more than once in billions of years of tries, so to speak, permutations. In billions of years of permutations, only one cell ever consumed another cell to create a double membraned nucleus. One time, in billions of permutations. As far as we know, there's only one neuron ever created. The whole mechanism of consciousness and thinking and feeling is all dependent on only one happening in 
billions of billions of permutations. It doesn't sound like very likely chemistry. So, anyway, small point, but mm, frankly important. Local area connection. My connection is failing. That's no good. I have to fix that. Such <sighs> a hassle. Anyway, I'll be back. All right, we'll play this part since he's on the imposition of risk. Well, there we go. That's a good subject. So let's see what he does with that one. Yeah, so let's play some of this. Now, I haven't been talking about the imposition argument because I believe it relies on the asymmetry argument. Um, and, and I'll explain that. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it doesn't at all. I mean, imposition argument is completely different from the ace image. It is a fact that um, they go together well, <laughs> but I don't see any dependency whatsoever. I don't even if pleasure was really a positive, I'd still say you don't have a right to impose negatives on non-willing victims. N no contract. Why right here, right? Um... I relies on the asymmetry argument, and I, what I've been doing is refuting the asymmetry argument. Uh, I mean, one can argue. I think I think one could rationally argue that slavery is socially beneficial in the long run. That in the long run, you gain progress through slavery. You get there quicker. You get to the future faster especially when you're starting to industrialize. There's a huge advantage in clearing fields and doing all that stuff with slave labor um, for what you're going to get, how you're going to get to the future faster. So you could argue you get all these benefits of progress sooner. And, um, but again, that still wouldn't justify the imposition on the individual minority that you're exploiting. You still can't dump all the pain on a minority for the public gain. It's still wrong unless they're volunteers willing to die in the war kind of a thing. I mean, clearly war is disproportionately burdensome on the soldiers. One could argue, though, if they volunteer for that disproportional risk because they want to protect people at home, then that's a different kind of contract. Not a great contract, but it's a better contract. Um, now, I'm not going to argue with the idea that life includes uncertainty. There's certain risks to being alive. But there's inevitable risks, and there's, there's inevitable cost to your existence. So again, you, previous to this diagram, he just conceded that he is dependent on the environment to produce much of what he lives on. And that, that environment, again, now he's just sitting there saying, well, no, this is some sort of vague uncertainty. No, there's an absolute price that's paid. Um, you know, exactly how it will be disposed is uncertain. But the fact that it will happen is kind of a fact. There will be a cost. The thing we need to do is evaluate risks. So... We're going to do this with a simple example of a game. Well, again, you're, you're, you're evaluating risk for somebody else. So this, you're not even paying any attention to the subject. The subject isn't a risk you're accepting. It's the subject is that you have a right to impose it based on your evaluations. You're claiming you're worth it. I'm saying you're not worth 10 cents, and you haven't demonstrated how you're worth more than 10 cents. How have you demonstrated it beyond just saying, I believe I'm worth it? That's all you've said. I believe it. Nothing else. That's not good enough. You have to prove it when you're going to sit there and shove a stick up someone else's ass. You've got to prove you have a reason to do that. Uh, and the game costs one dollar to roll a six-sided die. And we have two versions of this game. Um, in one version of the game, you can, if you roll a six, you gain five dollars. And in the other version of the game, if you roll a six, you gain seven dollars. And basically I'm saying the one with the higher payoff is the one worth playing, and the one with the lower payoff you should not play. Uh, whatever. So, yeah, you're just discounting again who pays. You're discounting the whole argument that the straws will be given to individuals and they'll get all or nothing. They'll win or they'll lose. And 
it's real. It's not some manufactured like, okay, we have a happy person, we got away with it, and it's all free. There's no free lunch ever. So to do the calculation, we're going to do a calculation called expected value. And the expected value is the payoff divided by the probability of receiving that payoff minus the cost of playing the game. All right. So again, so example, <laughs> again, he's just averaged the cost into this dollar thing that we're not even told who's paying that. Is the winner paying the dollar? Who's paying this dollar? There's no dollar being paid. No, there's victims who are going to pay minus seven dollars. They're going to pay the full freight here. Individuals will pay this full freight. There's no, again, there's no free gambling houses. We do know that, don't we? For every winner, there's two losers. We know that. Well, here, um, for the low payoff, right, it was $5 divided by 6 because there's a 1 in 6 chance of rolling a 6 and getting the $5, and then subtract $1, and that result will be less than 0. This is a game no one should play. It's not that I shouldn't play this game. It's that no one should play this game. For a payoff... And again, there's just no point in changing these... No I mean, the, the point is, is that how much are you uh, allowed to impose on a victim? So again, this doesn't have anything to do with the imposition argument. You're, you're just assuming that because uh, five out of six people are happy, therefore the five have a right to basically, if they wanted to cannibalize the one, they'd have a right to do it. They have no such right. You don't have a right to build your happiness out of somebody else's suffering. You have no right to feed on their pain. Of seven dollars divided by six, um, subtract one dollar, we get a result that's bigger than zero. Um, according to economic rationality, everyone should play this game. So, it's not about which individual plays the game. Um, well, okay, well, whatever. I'm not going to just play this for no good reason. I don't believe this is analogous in any way whatsoever to the way life happens to people. People are born and five-year-olds get cancer. Where's five-year-old with cancer in this crap? I don't see it anywhere. I don't see anything in there about any kind of big loser. Nothing. I don't see... Like, make this into like a football analogy somehow. Let's say this was football, and you were going to use this to judge whether football was a good investment. Where in this is the paralyzed kids? Show me the paralyzed kids in this equation somewhere where somehow football pays off. Show me how you make it pay off. Show me how you make it reasonable to paralyze kids for a silly addiction. Ugh, so we're back to the stupid autonomy word. So now he just said the non-existent, whatever that is. You mean the will-bees? Uh um, have no autonomy. Babies have no autonomy. As if they had no entitlement to respect. Um, and of course they do. They have a right to the same, they have a right to fairness. And proportionality. And to their portion of um, deserve. Deserve should have something to do with it. They deserve not to have their money stolen. They deserve you know, not to be put into debt by us, certainly. So to say they don't have any rights to these things is idiotic, or a claim to them. They have a claim, even though they don't yet exist. Um, they have a claim to a clean slate. They have a claim to clean water. They have a claim to as good as we got, so to speak. And it's a legitimate claim, one that needs to be respected. But autonomy is a stupid word. Nobody, you don't give autonomy to a child molester, you don't give autonomy to a rapist, you don't give autonomy to somebody who's perpetrated a crime. There's lots of things that disqualify autonomy. And as soon as you're trespassing on somebody else's welfare, you void any right to autonomy. As soon as you do something unreasonable, you don't have any right to it. You only have a right to be right. You don't have a right to be wrong.
logically. Autonomy is something that you learn and it grows throughout your childhood. Um, once again, like I said, this is not relevant. There's respectable judgment, and that's all there is. If you have judgment that's respectable, if you can demonstrate it to be respectable, if you can demonstrate it to be logical, then it's judgment that's respectable. But if your judgment is idiotic, Jews should be gassed, then you shouldn't have any autonomy because you're an idiot and an asshole. That's just obvious, I think. Uh, should I play more of this? I mean, I really hate this whole concept as a word, this whole gameplay that somehow you have some inalienable right to be an imbecile. You have no such fucking right, especially when you're living on a lifeboat with other people. You have no right to sink the boat. <sighs> Fuck. So, that's the imposition argument, and that's why the imposition argument relies on the fact that... So he claims that somewhere in here he has described children with cancer. No, I don't see it anywhere. Paralyzed kids. People like me who just don't find this at all satisfactory. They have higher standards than you fucking oink oinkers. You know, who will stick your little snozzola in any old trough. Well, I won't do that. I'm not an asshole. I don't eat turd. You people will. Um... That's your prerogative, but you don't have a right to impose it on me. You don't have a right to birth me in your pig pen. Like a bird that has to build a nest before it can lay eggs, you have an obligation to clean it up before you start farting out eggs. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he is on the asymmetry now, and uh, but he she led into it by saying. This is why imposition is relies on the asymmetry argument, which is just a pile of crap. The two arguments have nothing to do with each other beyond the fact that they're complementary, but they're different arguments. Jesus. Videos this week about this asymmetry matrix. Um, here it is as uh, laid out by uh, Inmendum and Glenos. Um... I think the matrices are the same, right? Um, so basically you've got two choices, exist or not exist, and both of these will have both pleasure and pain. Um, and so in their argument, you know, it's got plus one if you exist for pleasure, minus one for pain, um, relates in a total of zero for existence. For non-existence, um, the, the fact that the absence of the heroin addict, okay, is not a bad thing. It's not indifferent. It's not bad. But okay, go ahead. Put in different. It's probably the same difference. It, a non-existent being does not receive pleasure. They give that a zero. And then... the non It's not that they don't receive pleasure. And it's not that they're non-existent. Alright? It's that... It's the presumption is, the alternative argument is always that they would exist. Exist, not exist. It's comparing two states of being. They would be related to each other. One, if one happens, the other one doesn't happen. If, one ha if that one happens, the other one doesn't happen. You have to see them in that context. So the option is to have it or not to have it. If you don't have the addict, it's not a bad thing. It's not pain. It's not bad. It's just not a good. Not a good is not a bad. Right? Something that's not good isn't necessarily bad. Where if you take away bad, it's intrinsically good. That's the asymmetry. There's an intrinsic, unavoidable benefit to getting rid of bad and there is no intrinsic or unavoidable harm in getting rid of good see yeah <sighs> so we not? Receiving, not receiving pain uh, they give that a plus one for a total of plus one and now I feel this is dichotomous right it's kind of like saying uh, good, bad, therefore indifferent. Like if you had good and bad, then 
we get indifferent. And if you get indifferent to good, then you get good. Like, it's all kind of good, bad, dichotomous thinking. Again, indifferent isn't, this isn't any language anyone I know of has used. So I don't know exactly why you're imposing this indifferent part. But fine, let's see where you go with that. Which, as Hyde today points out, can quite easily lead to irreconcilable contradictions. So, um... Well, again, it depends on how you think about value. So, again, I'm just saying it seems quite obvious from my life experience. It does make an awful lot of sense that most of my comforts or pleasures come by me eliminating tensions, irritations, fears... All that kind of stuff. A delusional movie distracts me from my real life. It's enjoyable. It takes me away from reality and allows me to do something where I'm being gratified. And I don't have leprosy or whatever my current condition is. It takes us away from our mundane, cruel world and takes us to some world where we have power and control and that kind of stuff. And we viscerally enjoy that. I go to sleep and I have dreams and I can do all kinds of interesting things in those dreams that I can't do in my reality. So again, I'm released from burdens. Sometimes I have nightmares and they're full of burdens. But the idea is, is that this is a kind of a negative game intrinsically and that there's something very valuable about getting rid of negative conditions. A nail in my eye, prevented, is a good. Period. I can't think of anything that would be intrinsically good. I can only think of things that are bad, that are relieved. Again, with economics, we're going to talk about, well, how much. And we're going to do some little bit better math than just plus one and minus one. Um, for... Look, the point of it is just to illustrate this point, okay? That it's not a bad not to have a good. It's not a bad not to have a good. There's not bad happening on Mars because there's no one looking at a rainbow now or no one fucking or no one doing something else. We don't think of it as being bad. We don't cognize it as a bad. We don't weep for some lost, some holocaust of loss that's taking place on Mars right now. We do not perceive it to be a holocaust because all this good has been annihilated from existence. It doesn't exist where it could exist and it doesn't exist. And what a tragedy and a sadness, all that lost good. Where if I put suffering beings on Mars, all being tormented by Mengele, and I could in some way stop it from happening, we would all recognize that as a huge sigh of relief. Oh, the torture has stopped. They're, they're not torturing anymore. There's not all that angst and that sorrow and all that eyeballs bulging thing happening and all of that shit happening anymore. It's just kind of obvious. It's a sad, tragic truth of the existence of this conscious mechanism. But instead of dealing with that, rationalize your way out of it. Okay, come up with a rationalization to say that simple equation that the absence of a good is not a bad, but the absence of a bad is a good. Don't deal with that asymmetry that is hastemic. Just make rationalizations. Maybe some cliches. Good and bad to equal zero then good must equal bad. Um, I think we can get a bit more nuanced with this. So we're going to revisit good the matrix. Good equals bad. Um, oh, fuck so this. So basically, let's, let's start with these existing people. Um, basically, in the pleasure category, I, I'm talking about happiness. They, these guys both started with P, so I said, well, we're going to do happiness and suffering. Um, so, your total amount of happiness in life is the percent of your life where you experience happiness multiplied by the average um, intensity of that happiness. Um, similarly, uh, experiencing pain is the percent of your life where you suffer multiplied by the intensity of that suffering. Now, this is... Uh, I mean, how does this help? Oh, that's right. This won't help at all. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be uh, all a bit bad news. of ambiguity here, right? Because the intensity of suffering is greater than typically the intensity of happiness. 
Um, yes, that's right. Comfort. See, comfort has an end to it. Where the other stuff kind of doesn't have an end going down. You can always add another nail and another orifice. Um, you can always add another nail, right? You can just keep nailing shit. Um, where bliss, or perfect comfort, is kind of perfect comfort. You really can't do any better than that. You can't do double perfect comfort. So, these things are not equal. Um, this one is bigger than this one. And then, the, the percent of time that um, we do in the happiness is greater than the percent of time that we do in the suffering. So, um, while the intensity is suffering is bigger than happiness, for the percent time, happiness is bigger than suffering, creating ambiguous results. Um, well, 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 you know, that, again, this has nothing to do with the imposition argument, which was, you were supposed to show the connection, which I don't see in any of this nonsense. Um, because the imposition can be purely horrible suffering and no happiness. Um, but regardless, um, I just, I just don't, I don't, first I don't think this is the way, this, this is, is analogous to what life really is, in the sense that, um, it only takes one bad apple to spoil the pie kind of thing. And you're not going to come up with any good apple that's worth any kind of suffering. And we know that for most people, the game isn't really about the quality of their life or any of this math. It just has to be how, how addicted are they, how dependent are they, or how afraid are they of the void of non-existence, the ego degrade of giving it up. That's the real issue. And it really doesn't have anything to do with this quality of life thing. We know that for many people, they'll live a horrid quality of life. And because they are so addicted to the idea of their existence, that they'll still claim they're winning. But the claim doesn't have any integrity, does it? Is it really a logical statement? Or is it a statement made out of a huge necessity, an optimism bias, where they must defend their existence. I think it's quite obvious it's psychology, not philosophy. But because people, you know, make the choices in life, um, you've got... Again, these aren't choices. That was the whole point of the imposition argument. You really don't get it. I did not choose to be here. I did not do that. Anyway, I'll be back. I, I mean, this is, yeah, inane, <laughs> inane, inane-ish, so I'll be back. I mean, I'll spare you. I'm just doing it for your sake. I mean, I, I could just play it, but, I, you know, I don't want to hurt you. It looks like this is going to hurt. So, anyway, I'll be back. Well, this was just totally in, uh, incomprehensible. So, he did try to reduce this number to something less than one. And he's trying to make this number somehow go more than zero. So, so he's created the autonomy again. Because people want, because they're addicted. So again, not did not deal with the word addiction. Doesn't understand it as a concept, I suppose. It's not a rational concept. It's a compulsion created by psychology. You got to understand that. Again, the want only exists in your head. It doesn't exist in the real world. The need, let's say, for something that you value. You value it. It has no intrinsic value. A diamond has no intrinsic value. It's almost entirely, I mean a diamond for cosmetic purposes, no intrinsic value. It only has value in projections and stupid deluded psychologies that project value onto it. Um, so there's no actual value where the sentient being has an actual value because of its capacity to be harmed or its fragile nature. If it wasn't fragile, if it couldn't be broken, then the value would be, it wouldn't be necessary to value it because it would be endurable. And it's the very fact that it's vulnerable to being harmed is where it derives its value. There's value in the capacity to degrade its condition. So anyway, 
and that's what this is about. You're not going to advance nothing's condition by making it into a something. There's no advantage to being something. None. So we'll, we'll play this, see where his next slide goes to. How much is it? That's the question we want to know. So how much is the value of human life? And this is important to put a number in here or some function of means of calculating the number. Well, again, that's your game, okay? It's not my game. I don't believe the existence in itself has any value. I'm saying the experience has value. And as Benatar is basically saying that also, that all you really have in the end um, are these positive feelings, the sense of it anyway, um, and this negative harm, suffering. And that's all you have. There isn't anything else. Um, because if we do not assign some value to life, some specific value to, to, to human life... Benatar assigned the value. Okay, in, in a sense, he assigned the value, and the asymmetry demonstrates that the math comes up negative, that it's better, more profitable, or less loss, either way you want to look at it, it's more profitable not to do it, or there's less loss if you don't do it. So either way you look at it, that's the way to go. Of the two choices, exist or non-exist, you'll win by not existing because you won't lose. That is the same as adding zero in our calculations. So what we're going to do here is um, pay our expected value is the payoff of someone taking a dangerous job, of risking their life for money, and divided by the probability of death. Well, again, I don't see how this relates to the imposition argument. I certainly don't see how this relates to the asymmetry argument. So, again, I don't, I don't really understand. Again, you just keep doing this with this economics crap. It is not an economics. It's a logic equation, but it's not an economic equation. Logic, philosophy requires you to add more components than this. I mean, just before you were adding something as stupid as autonomy which you couldn't put in any kind of equation as any kind of real value. Um, <laughs> but yet you'll play this game. There's no way you could do this with your autonomy thing. There's no way you could put it in an equation. You could never give it a real value, even if you were to say it had any value, which I don't say it has any value. Now, obviously, um, there's a, a, a problem with this calculation in that um, it would take more money to get a richer person to take an expensive job. So by this calculation, rich people are worth more than poor people, and that is seems incorrect. Um, it, it just seems incorrect to think that we're anywhere... I value my life that, just that as what? much as you value your life. Well, let's see what happens here. The browser wants to blow up, I think. Um... But anyway, this doesn't get to, um, it's not only a rich man, poor man thing, but obviously these standards are based on how we end up in our economy valuing work, which really just has to do with how many people are desperate enough to take the job. So first there has to be desperation, okay? People don't do dangerous jobs unless they're desperate. They don't do it because they have better choices. They do it because they don't have better choices. It did blow up. Um... So that's kind of a bogus comparison right there. To, to sit there and slot it in here as if there is really some rational economic equation. It's never a rational economic equation. It's only one created by the fact that you create somebody who has to do it. Not just somebody who wants to do it. Shit. So again, you're not dealing with the impositional nature or notions like coercion or extortion. And these are real things that happen in the real world. People are extorted and coerced into bad contracts. They don't have volunteer to, to sign bad contracts. They do it because they have no fucking option. Capitalist pig. Anyway. Um, and then the million versus Venatar. I don't think that's it. <laughs> I think I'll get rid of that one and get rid of that one. I think these can stay. Okay, we just do these. 
Now, inventum is not okay, we'll go back to here. function of means of calculating the number, um, because if we do not assign some value to life, some specific value okay, to, to, we got to there already. life, Careful. now, obviously, um, there's a, a, a problem with this calculation in that um, Poor part again. it would take more money to get a richer person to take an expensive job. So by this calculation, Dangerous job, you rich mean. people are worth more than poor people, and that is seems incorrect. Um, <laughs> yeah, especially when they inherited the money, then it really I seems incorrect. I value my life just as much as you value Jeez. your life, supposedly. So, um, well, again, that's not even the point again, right? It really has to do with this conditional statement. What things do I, what obligations do I have? I have do I have six kids to feed? Do I have this? Do I have, it has nothing to do with what I value. I value my kids. Maybe, maybe I value my wife. Maybe I value something else besides myself. Many people go to work. Many people immigrate to this country to go to work merely to make their families rich back home. So that's why we're going to take the average, as I was mentioning before. Um, that uh, the value of human life is what the average person would need to take it. Again, I don't do my philosophy based on what the average person thinks is valuable, how much they put on a rainbow or how much they put on, you know, wiping a snotty nose. So it, it means absolutely nothing to me. This is just, now you're just going to argue subjective interpretations of value and then you're going to say, well, when I calculate out what people think, this is what people think, therefore it's the truth. No, not even fucking close. That's not philosophy, again. You're just articulating psychological positions, and then you're saying because there's a certain number of this psychological position, that must be the truth. Because most people believe in angels, therefore angels must exist. No. Dangerous job, given the probability of death at that job, right? So... Here's an estimate here. Um, basically, it's uh, $650 for someone to take a uh, dangerous job. And it's not excessively dangerous. This is based off of, I think, construction or roofing or something like that. Um, where 17.7 .7 people out of 100,000 um, die on the job. Um, so with this calculation, your life is... How many are they injured? How many are paralyzed? Again, so just... <laughs> Kind of important. It's worth three million dollars, six hundred seventy-two thousand dollars, and three hundred sixteen dollars. Um, now, in economics, we might convert this to an annual figure, like to divide this by the expected life and life of a person, so we can get an annual number, and that way, young people are worth more than old people because they've got more life to lose. Um, but because it's an average. The only way to make your life uh, worth more is to raise the standard of living for everyone. That the that that. Does it, does this make any sense to you? Not to me. Not even close. <laughs> yeah. No. Sorry. This is. This isn't. This is. What the fuck is this? And what does it have to do with this averagey crap? Why is this? Why should this mean something to me? You want to make your life valuable to the, in, in a sense of productive. Yeah, you have to make something. You have to give the world back more than you take. So I could argue right now you're taking every day of your life thousands of sentient creatures are killed in horrible ways by nature to create the biosphere you're living on. So how did you compensate for those thousands, perhaps millions of sentient organisms horribly slaughtered by nature today, your percentage of them, your one seven billionth of that price, how did you compensate for it? What did you do today? What did you give back that was so precious? that I would logically torture thousands or perhaps millions of sentient creatures to create. 
Did you do anything today worth that? I don't think you did. And that's why I'm an ethicist, which means not only human life fails, life fails. The only way, way to raise the average is by making everyone better off, um, excluding outliers, of course. And right, better off is what? Have enough money to afford 10 years in a nursing home. I don't think so. So, um... Obamacare for everyone. That's my presentation on the value of human life. And I'm hoping that this will... Con continue. <laughs> Confuse. Yes, yes, you, you were very confusing. So you did accomplish that. You on the composition of economics so we can see how we might use this in such some of these calculations. So, um... No, I don't think this is a rational way to do philosophy. Again, logic would be a nice thing for you to apply. Their economics should be logical. Economics isn't logical, as it's currently performed in the world, because economics doesn't recognize extortion and coercion. <laughs> yeah, if you don't recognize those two forces as negative, and that you can't have them in contracts, well then I guess your economics fails. And certainly if you don't recognize the imbalance of initial starting points. You can't have a fair game if some players get head starts. Can you? No, you can't. It's preposterous. It's idiotic on its face. Isn't it? One guy gets 50 strikes, the other guy gets three. Fair game. One guy gets a loaded bat, an atomic nuclear bat. The other guy gets a fucking stick. Again, thanks for watching, and uh, have a great afternoon. Well, it's not really afternoon here, but oakley doke. I will replace it with the appropriate amount of time and uh, ignore that uh, it's not the proper time. <laughs> but anyway, till next time.